being pilgrims uh, in a post-faith world. And with Abraham in our first class, we looked at the principles uh, of being a pilgrim. Uh, we thought about Abraham, who in a traditional sense was a pilgrim and that he journeyed, that he lived in a tent. Uh, but what we saw was that really when the scriptures talk about him being a stranger and a pilgrim, it was about something much more. It was about the fact that he had separated, that he had left behind uh, the Babylonian culture in which he grew up. It was about his vision of faith for the future, the certain promises that God had made to him, which he counted as better uh, than the things that were on offer in Ur. As the Hebrews record said, if he'd been mindful of that, he could have gone back, uh, but rather he remained steadfast in faith until the day he died. Uh, and we saw finally the third pilgrim principle uh, that God walks with you from the beginning of your life to the end of your life. He knew you from before you were born. His promises for you are to eternity. So we come now then, as our brother says, to our second class, and we're thinking here about Abraham's great grandson, Joseph, where Abraham was able to live out his pilgrimage under the Canaanite sky, looking at the stars that God had appointed uh, in the heavens so many years before. Joseph had to live out part of his pilgrimage, much of his pilgrimage through grave trial. He couldn't see the stars because he was bound in an Egyptian dungeon. And so what we'll see here is that pilgrimage, first and foremost, is not about a physical journey. Uh, it's not about uh, the, the tent and the walking, even though that was, as we say, part of what Abraham was called upon to do. Pilgrimage uh, is about where your mind and where your heart and where your soul are. And Joseph's remained with God uh, through some of the most challenging trial on record in the scriptures. We're going to look at events today, which I believe would break the faith uh, of many. Uh, and yet Joseph was able to work his way through all of this and still see the hand of God very much at work in his life. Uh, as we read there in Genesis 50, he was able to look back and see that God meant it for good. God meant it unto good, uh, as the scriptures say. Uh, so he is a man of remarkable uh, faith. And, uh, you know, for me, there are so many moments in his story that just stand out as uh, really uh, awe-inspiring. You know, one of my personal favorites is uh, when after, as we'll show you, 13 years of hard trial, slavery and in imprisonment down in Egypt, he stands before Pharaoh and declares the God of Israel. Uh, and he does it with real risk uh, in terms of how Pharaoh was going to receive that statement of faith. You know, so as we go through this, we're caused to ask ourselves, how? You know, how did this young man have that much bravery, that much steadfastness? Where did this sort of faith come from? He was young when his story really starts in earnest. Uh, he's 17 years of old. The Bible uh, and God in his wisdom makes a point to let us know uh, that he was a young person when he faced into uh, these many years of trial. Uh, and as we go through this, certainly it causes me to say, you know, how do we build in our young people uh, this sort of faith, this sort of commitment to our God? Uh, I showed you at the start uh, of the first class, my family, you know, my daughter, my eldest daughter is nine years old. Joseph was 17 uh, when he entered into this period of grave trial. Uh, of course, I hope and pray that uh, what came upon Joseph will not come upon any of our young people before Jesus Christ returns. But we're caused to ask the question, you know, how can we build uh, in our young people the sort of faith and steadfastness and assurance that Joseph had that at 17 years of age, effectively, he was set. And of course, as we showed in the class with Abraham, God was still with him every step of the way, but it was through grave trial. And he hung on in there because of the faith that he had. What we're going to see together is that Joseph's strength of mind and Joseph's strength of character came from his clear understanding and clear belief in the covenant promises that God had made to Abraham, to Isaac and to Jacob. I'm convinced that he had been taught them, taught them passionately in his family home to a point where at 17 years he was able to go from that place against his will, of course, uh, and survive uh, 
through grave trial and hold on to the things that he'd been taught from a very early age were precious, uh, were to be held on to, were to be revered. He was a man of faith. He went through dark times, but as we'll see, God was with him uh, all the way. And at the appointed time, as we know, God lifted him up and made him a nourisher so that God could save many people alive. That was his purpose with Joseph. So uh, as with all of the talks that we'll go through together, God willing, this weekend, we've broken it into three parts. We want to start by thinking about that period of trial. We've called it not all pilgrims can walk because, of course, as we showed you in the first class, the dictionary definition of a pilgrim is one who goes on a journey. Well, Jacob, we're taught, was there in a prison with his feet in fetters. He couldn't walk. And yet he was a magnificent pilgrim, a magnificent young man of faith. And and when we read the Hebrews 11 record, as we read together in our first class, and God looks back on the life of many faithful, there's so many incidents, as I say, in in Joseph's life that are all inspiring that we could uh, imagine God could have turned to, to illustrate the faith of Joseph. You know, you think about Abraham or Moses in that chapter, and there's a number of things that the scriptures call out uh, about what they did uh, and why that pleased God. With Joseph, it's just that verse and uh, it's, it's a verse that focuses on his faith and conviction at the end of his life. Uh, and we're going to go through and understand together, uh, at least suggest from the scriptures, why it was that God uh, focused on his faith right there at the end of his life. That he was able to look back through all of that trial, through all of that separation from family uh, and to say, you know what, God meant all of this unto good. Uh, and then he made, as we see in Hebrews 11, Uh, commandment concerning his bones. So we'll come on to that uh, together, uh, God willing, uh, as we go through the class. By faith, Joseph, uh, you know, he was a man who had been schooled in the covenant promises. He'd been taught them directly uh, by the men and women who had received them. And by the age of 17, he passionately believed in those things. There's no other way Uh, that he could have gotten to the end of his life uh, and still look back in faith in the way that he did if he didn't have that firm foundation in his youth. If you think about the influences uh, that he had after leaving his family home for all those years in uh, Egypt, there was no uh, influence from a Bible, no influence from family, no influence from brothers and sisters. What he had at 17, uh, plus, of course, the guiding hand of God in his life was what carried him through. Uh, So, so much that we can learn, I think, from this wonderful example of Joseph. Uh, You know, when we think about uh, our motivation, our why for this sort of study, there's just a couple of verses here up front that I'd like to share with you uh, as I was reflecting on this man and and the trial that he went through. Um, The first one is not specific to Joseph. In fact, uh, as the writer to the Hebrews is writing this, I think he's talking about those who were bound at the time. Uh, So as uh, Christians in the first century, uh, of course, there was much grave trial uh, that the brothers and sisters had to go through, uh, including some who were, uh, of course, put into prison for their faith. And and as he writes, he says, you know, you have to remember them as if you were bound with them. Uh, In other words, as you're thinking, as you're meditating uh, upon your brothers and your sisters who are going through trial, you almost have to try and live alongside them in your mind. You're not there in the prison. You're not bound physically, but remember them as if you were. Try to put yourself into their shoes. And I suggest to you that that principle there uh, in the Hebrews letter is one that we can apply. Uh, We can apply it today, potentially, if we know brothers and sisters in uh, such challenging circumstances. But I believe we can also apply it when we're thinking about uh, characters in the scripture, like Joseph, who were uh, bound and in prison. You know, Paul instructs, remember as if you were there. And I'd suggest to you that with the story of Joseph, for it really uh, to impress upon us, for it really to uh, motivate us, uh, we need to try and get into the story and live it alongside him. We hope and pray, uh, as we say, that we won't and that our children won't face into the sort of trial that he had to face into. Uh, But we can certainly, I think, with our Bibles open, live it alongside him. And that's a tough thing to do. You know, if we take this seriously, if we think hard about what the scriptures have laid down for us in terms of his life, 
and that period of trial. It's not an easy thing to go into that trial with him and really live it out, but it's something we have to do. The, the Lord, through his prophet Amos, admonishes to those who are at ease in Zion, and amongst a number of things that he says to them, you know, the woe that he's pouring out upon them is that they're not grieved for the affliction of Joseph. Now, there may be many meanings to that, but in the simplest of terms, as, as I'm taking it for this class, it's, you know, they're being admonished for not having got into uh, this story of Joseph, not having remembered what it took for God's people uh, to be kept alive at the time of Joseph, the trial and the affliction, the hurt that he had to go through uh, in order that God's people could be saved. And as we say that, of course, uh, it echoes, doesn't it, uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many echoes in the story uh, of Joseph uh, that, of course, echo through to Jesus himself. And we'll not be actively calling too many out this morning, but they're certainly there. And I'm sure uh, as we go through, you'll spot one or two. Uh, and uh, that's motivating too. But this is uh, first and foremost, not a class on uh, scriptural types. It's a class on character. It's a class on uh, being pilgrims, being pilgrims in trial. I, I think, brothers and sisters, as I say, it is a hard thing to do to get into the story uh, in the way that I was describing there. And we're never going to achieve that fully uh, in one class together as we read it through, as we think about it. Hopefully what it does do is just whet your appetite enough to, to make you think, you know, I want to spend more time here with this man in his trial. And as I say, that's a hard thing to do if we take it seriously. Um, these were unpleasant times, to say the least. And I think it causes us to question. It causes us to ask, why would God do this? Uh, Joseph was able to go through that questioning and come out the other side and say he did it uh, because he's faithful. He meant it unto good. Uh, so this is a class about trial, and uh, it's a class about the example of Joseph, but it's also a class about our God uh, and how he's involved in our lives. We saw in, in our first class his loving and guiding and caring hand, which was with, uh, amongst others, Abraham every day uh, of his pilgrimage. Uh, that same loving and caring and guiding hand was with Joseph as he went through, as we say, some of the hardest trial on record in scripture and i think if we spend that time uh, with him uh, and really try and get inside the story we do become grieved for the affliction uh, that he suffered uh, but we're also highly motivated by the faith uh, and the resilience that he showed uh, and the ability to look back on his life uh, and pronounce his faith in god uh, in the way that he did uh, in genesis 47 and in genesis 50 as we as we read together so uh, I think the trials are well known to you. The stories, uh, of course, a, a Sunday school story. We're not certainly going to be able to really get across in uh, one class here, one virtual class, uh, the magnitude of this trial and this suffering. But maybe we just encourage you to uh, spend some time with your Bible open, trying to live that out. So this first part, then, not all pilgrims can walk. The trial began, of course, with Joseph at 17 years of age. Uh, it appears to me as I read the record through that uh, that was the age he was when he was sold. Maybe there was a, a time period in that 37th chapter and uh, therefore his uh, period of trial in Egypt was less. But it appears to me he was 17 when all of this uh, really started. And of course, we know how he was sent by his father to his brethren uh, and how they stripped him and cast him into a pit uh, and there was no water in the pit. And as we're reading through that 37th chapter, there's uh, very little there about Joseph's reaction. We don't really learn too much about how he uh, was feeling or responding uh, to his brothers at that time. But uh, the scriptures do lay it down for us, as you can see here in Genesis 42, as the brothers are uh, talking to themselves and remembering and realizing uh, what they've done. And you can tell, of course, that it's been on their conscience for those years. You know, we are very, verily guilty concerning our brother in that we saw the anguish of his soul when he besought us and we would not hear. You know, so this is where it started, 17 years of age, his own brothers uh, doing this to him. Uh, and you can see there was anguish in his soul. He, he was beseeching them. He was crying out for mercy uh, as they took him and stripped him and threw him in this pit and then subsequently went on uh, to sell him into slavery. And we can only just imagine the horror uh, of that time uh, as he was uh, betrayed in that way. And so, of course, he goes down uh, to Egypt and uh, 
He sold into the house of Potiphar. Potiphar was the captain of the guard. It really means uh, Pharaoh's chief executioner. Uh, you can't imagine this was an easy household uh, to be a slave in. And yet, as we know, uh, the Lord was with Joseph. And uh, this comes through in the story that we're, we're living on, on the one hand through uh, this terrible trial that he endured. Uh, and on the other hand, the scriptures uh, reiterate to us that God was with him through that trial. Brothers and sisters, it doesn't mean the trial was easy. I'm sure there were uh, many sleepless nights, many tears, much distress and anguish and bitterness of soul uh, and fear, uh, fear for the day, fear for the future. Uh, and yet God was with him there, this young man who was ripped away uh, from his family home, ripped away from the positive influences that were there uh, and is down now as a slave here in Egypt. Well, of course, things seem to be going better for him. He uh, becomes the overseer of Potiphar's house. He obviously was blessed by God. Potiphar could see that uh, and he made him his overseer. And yet, uh, of course, we know that the trial uh, continues. It continues with Potiphar's wife who had cast her eye uh, upon Joseph. Uh, and it's interesting as we read this, there's just an indication uh, in the scriptures here of the nature uh, of the world, the nature of the spirit of the world that was here present in Egypt, as we saw it was in Chaldea and in Babylon uh, in our first class. As you can see with the verse on the screen there, you know, as she tempts him, he refuses. You can see that his mind is with God. You know, it's a sin against God that he's not willing to participate in. We don't know how long he's been in the house. It has to, of course, be some time for, for him to have become the overseer. So, you know, as the, as the years roll on, uh, his mind is still very clearly here with God. And he's not willing. He's not willing uh, to sin against God, tempted as he might have been. And in the next verse, in Genesis 39, 10, it came to pass as she spake to Joseph day by day. Uh, that is what the scriptures say. She spoke to him daily, daily. That's how... Uh, the Hebrew language is on record. Daily, daily, uh, the temptation was there in front of him. Uh, there's a Bible echo uh, with Daniel chapter one. We went to Daniel one in our first class to think about those young men who were taken off into captivity in some ways, uh, a parallel circumstance, unable to escape from the influence of, in the one case, Egypt, uh, in the other case, Babylon. And it tells us in Daniel one verse five that the king appointed them daily, daily provision of the king's meat, daily temptation for Joseph, daily temptation for Daniel and his friends. What do you do uh, when the world is in your face daily? How do you respond? Well, here's the faith of Joseph. I am not going to sin against God. What did Daniel do? He purposed in his heart. Two outstanding young men dedicated to their God, dedicated to the hope of Israel. So thinking through this period of trial, trying to put yourself into his shoes, thinking about that rejection from his own brothers, the anguish of his soul, the fear of slavery, and now the temptation uh, of Potiphar's wife that's in his face daily, uh, daily. And he stands firm, doesn't he, against that temptation. Uh, and then, of course, the, the false accuser. Uh, she accuses him uh, and he is sent to prison. And uh, just that phrase there in, in Genesis 39, verse 20, you know, some of the things that God's servants have had to endure and j just the simplest of phrases to sum it up. He was there in the prison. And you can think about the Lord Jesus Christ, you know, and they crucified him. Uh, and, and the Bible's not trying to indulge us in any of the details it's giving us enough uh, to allow us as we say to take our mind into uh, the trial of Joseph and to think about what it was that he had to endure he was there in the prison it just seems to be going from bad to worse for him doesn't it you know unfairly sold unfairly treated by his own brothers sold as a slave trying to live by godly standards in Potiphar's house and then with false accusation, uh, he's down there in the prison. As we said, as we go through the story, we, we get both sides. We, we, we feel the trial, 
Uh, and we also see the hand of God uh, still being with his servant. And so it was that here in the prison too, the scriptures are on record for saying that the Lord was with Joseph and showed him mercy. Do you remember that third pilgrim principle? I will show you. I will walk with you. Uh, I will show you the land. I will bring you to the kingdom. This is ultimately what God is saying there to all those who would be pilgrims. And that is true wherever you are. Uh, as the psalmist says, where can I go from your spirit or where can I flee from your presence? If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. And so, you know, Joseph, I'm sure, fared better in prison than he would have done were it not for that intervention from God. But again, this was trial. And as we say, the scriptures don't tell us too much uh, about this time. But there is, of course, that verse uh, in the Psalms there where uh, they talk, uh, uh, the psalmist talks about uh, God's dealings with his people. Uh, and as he gets to Joseph, uh, he just gives us those words whose feet they hurt with fetters. He sent a man before them, even Joseph, who was sold as a servant, whose feet they hurt with fetters. He was laid in iron, the psalmist says. You know, and in type, we, we talked about the types of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. Maybe here we have the bruising of the heel. But again, let's try and focus on the character. Let's try and focus on the trial. You know, a dark dungeon, your feet bound, designed to hurt you. And through all of this, he held on day by day, night by night. The young man who hadn't seen an Israelite since he was 17 years of age, who had lived in Potiphar's house according to godly principles, who had done no wrong that he should be put in the dungeon, even as he himself said uh, to the butler and the baker, here he is now, uh, his feet being hurt uh, in the dark prison cell. And, and it's these times that he was able to look back on and say, God meant it unto good. The Bible doesn't tell us too much, uh, at least directly, uh, about what was going through his mind. Uh, and as we hope to show a little later in the class, clearly the covenant promises were there every day as he held on through this trial. You know, here is a, a, a timeline for you. We don't know for sure. Uh, how long he was in Potiphar's house. We don't know for sure how long he was in prison. It does appear to be a, a total period of around 13 years. You can see, of course, in Genesis 37, as we've said, he was 17 uh, at the time it all started. It's not impossible. Uh, there was some delay before he ended up uh, being sent by Jacob to his brothers. But I work on the basis he was 17 still at that time. And he was 30, uh, as we know from Genesis 41, when he stood in front of Pharaoh there, Obviously, it had to be some time in Potiphar's house for him to become overseer. There had to be some time in the prison for him to become overseer there as well. And then uh, we know that the butler and the baker come in there in prison for a season. It tells us that in Genesis 40, you can see that at the top there. And then there's two full years after the butler has been reinstated before uh, Joseph is called out in front of Pharaoh. So, you know, as you're trying to spend time uh, with this young man in his trial, um, it is years. How many each way? Uh, we're not sure. Maybe it's half and half. We don't know. But we know that it was a long, hard period for him by the time he stands in front of Pharaoh at 30 years of age. It would appear about 13 years in total between slavery and imprisonment. So, so just try and put yourself into that situation. You're 30 years old. Uh, since the age of 17, all you've known is slavery and imprisonment in a strange land. Yes, God has been with you, and that's clear. Uh, but you've suffered immensely through those long, dark years. Uh, and think about how you would respond now to Pharaoh if you were put in the same position Joseph was put in, where he's pulled out of that cell and quickly and hurriedly uh, changed and taken in front of Pharaoh. And Pharaoh asks him, of course, about whether he can interpret his dream. Would you at that point declare your faith in God? After 13 years of immense hardship in slavery, uh, in imprisonment, uh, with your feet uh, in fetters designed to hurt you, would you stand in front of a despot, the, 
pharaoh of butler and baker fame who had his baker, uh, as we know, hung up. And would you say, pharaoh, no, uh, it's not in me, but God can give you an answer of peace. It's remarkable, isn't it, that after those years, he is still with his God. He really had one shot here, you know, one shot to be out of that prison. And uh, he could have played it safe. I'm sure I would have played it safe if I was uh, in that place. I, I, if, if my faith in God was intact, I, I don't know if I would be declaring it at this point to Pharaoh. I'd be just hoping to uh, tell him his dream. And this is not Joseph's faith. Joseph's faith is stronger. Uh, he says, no, Pharaoh, it's not in me. It's God who will give you an answer of peace. 13 years later, humbly walking with his God. So, as I say, brothers and sisters, in a class like this, we can't get across uh, in any way uh, this period of trial and affliction. Uh, as uh, Hebrew says, and as Amos says, we have to try and live through it. I think it's important that we do that. Uh, and if we do, we're left to marvel at a point like this, where a man uh, of this age and this tenderness could stand in front of this despot and declare his faith in his God. And he was able, as we uh, go on to say at the end of his life, to look back over all of that, all those years in Egypt and say, look, God meant this unto good. He knew God. He knew his heavenly father. And uh, what I hope to do now is just spend a little bit of time taking you through that and thinking about his, uh, his confidence, his assurance, his motivation and uh, his steadfastness through all of this. So a quote from the psalm there where the psalmist says, I, I know, O Lord, that thy judgments are right and that thou in faithfulness hast afflicted me. It's the same word used in Psalm 105, where we, we learn that Joseph's feet were hurt or afflicted, if we were to use the same translation with fetters. Joseph believed that God is, as we read in Hebrews 11, he believed in God and he knew God. He understood that God was working with him through trial. It can only be the only way he was able to stand in front of Pharaoh and declare as he did is because he believed in and he knew God. And even in his trial, he was able to bring that mindset of the psalmist there and say, I know that in faithfulness you afflicted me. I'm sure there were ups and downs. I'm sure there were doubts. I'm sure it was incredibly challenging for him, but his faith won through. And you can see it. Uh, we read Genesis 50 together, uh, but, you know, as he's talking to his brothers uh, some chapters earlier, you know, it was God who sent me before you. He did it to preserve life. God's hand was there. It was God who sent me, verse 7. It wasn't you. Uh, it was God. Uh, it's God who's made me Lord over Egypt. He was able to see uh, God's hand there working in his life. And of course, uh, our, our title for the talk is taken from the very end of his life when he was uh, 110 years old. But uh, here, uh, just in his late 30s, he's already looking back uh, on that trial in such uh, a positive way. God meant it unto good to bring to pass as it is this day to save much people alive. There he is now after the death of his father, as his brothers are concerned that in some way Joseph is magnificent man of faith would now turn on them. And again, he reassures them. He nourishes them. Uh, he cares for them. The one that they stripped and sold uh, has become uh, their nourisher and their protector. Uh, and he speaks to them kindly, uh, as we can see here on the screen. And he has faith. Uh, he believes that God meant it unto good. Uh, and we're caused to ask, you know, how? How did he have this sort of faith? How did he have this sort of faith at such a young age? Uh, how was he able to hang on through this trial without the influence of family, without the influence uh, of his Bible, uh, without an ecclesia? Uh, how was it that at age 17, he was already uh, prepared uh, for that trial? We're not going to go through uh, in detail the, the, the time frames on the slide here. What we've effectively tried to do is just show you that uh, Jacob and Isaac potentially uh, had influence in the life of Joseph, along, of course, with his mother, uh, Rachel, uh, and Leah as well. We know that Rachel died when Joseph was still relatively young. Uh, 
Uh, j just to give you some of the dates very quickly, Jacob came uh, to Egypt, we know, at, at 130. And at the same point, Joseph was 39, uh, 30 years of age in front of Pharaoh, seven years of plenty and two years of famine, bring you to 39 years age. And so we can see that Jacob was quite old at the time uh, Joseph was born. He was, in fact, 91. And at that point, he was living in the house of Laban. Uh, and we cover this timeline just to try and think about the period uh, that Joseph lived in Israel uh, and with uh, in Laban's house initially, and then in Israel, uh, in Canaan, before he uh, went down as uh, a slave into Egypt. So uh, he was born in Laban's house. Uh, and we know that Jacob was 20 years in Laban's house in total. It tells us that in Genesis 31. Uh, and I think we can uh, safely say from uh, the, the previous chapter that after 14 years of service for Leah and for Rachel, Joseph was born. Uh, as we might remember, Jacob then works another six years for uh, Laban's cattle, and then he leaves his home. So the suggestion would be, uh, and I'm very open to uh, any other ideas on these timelines, we're just trying to put them together uh, in a simple way from the Bible here. It would appear that Joseph was about six years old when he left Laban's house. So uh, he had uh, those early memories uh, of being there. Uh, he would have uh, remembered, I'm sure, at the time when Jacob separated from Laban, uh, and he went on those journeys with Jacob, um, as we can see laid out here on the screen. Uh, so uh, Jacob comes back, as we know, from Laban's house into the land. He comes first of all to Shechem. Uh, you might remember his interactions with uh, the inhabitants of Shechem, uh, with his daughter Dinah and uh, his two sons, uh, Simeon and Levi. Uh, he then moves to Bethel under the commandment of God. Uh, he comes through Ephrath, which is Bethlehem, we're told. This is where Rachel, Joseph's mother, died. So these are all memories that uh, Joseph, I'm sure, would have had. Uh, he lays his tent uh, beyond Edar. Uh, and then finally, he comes to uh, Hebron, which is, you might remember from our first class, where Abraham moved to after he was given the promise of the land and where Isaac, uh, Jacob's father, was still alive, it would appear to me, from the time frames. Uh, and uh, Joseph would potentially, therefore, have spent some time with Isaac as well. I'd love to get any comments or questions on that idea. Uh, but here's the point, you know, 17 years uh, with that family, 17 years listening to the covenant promises uh, being spoken about, as I'm sure they were on a daily basis. Uh, it didn't seem to rub off, at least initially, on many of uh, Joseph's brothers, uh, but they'd certainly rubbed off on him. And so uh, he went on to be a man who was able to uh, give commandment concerning his bones. We'll think for in, in a moment about what that means. Um, uh, but let's think about his inspiration. You know, why was it that uh, he gave commandment concerning his bones? And as importantly, why is it that uh, the scripture chooses this as the example of Joseph's faith? As we've seen, there's many things that could have been recorded in Hebrews 11 regarding Joseph. It, we could have talked about his faith in Potiphar's house, his faith under temptation with Potiphar's wife, his, his faith in the prison, but instead uh, it mentions his faith when he died. Uh, and two things are called out. He made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and he gave commandment concerning his bones. Uh, and we go here because I want to show you that effectively what's on record here in the Hebrews is telling us that Joseph understood the covenant promises. This is why his faith is called out here. He, he died in faith, making mention of the departing of the children of Israel and giving commandment concerning his bones. And I'd suggest to you that both parts of that, uh, the departing of the children of Israel, the commandment concerning his bones, both tell us he was a man who understood the covenant promises. Let's have a look at that together. So firstly, then, uh, he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel. Uh, and then uh, you can see on the screen there as well where I think he got that from. So Joseph, and remember here, he's now what, 100 and getting close to 110 years old. Uh, he's looking back over his life, uh, 17 years uh, journeying with Jacob, taking in all of that influence, all of that understanding of the covenant promises. Uh, and now 93 years later, you know, after 93 years in Egypt, he just made that one short trip back to bury his father. Uh, he's making mention of the departing of the children of Israel. Why would he do that? Why was this in Joseph's mind when he died? Well, of course, he knew 
the covenant promises. He knew what God had said to Abraham those years before. Genesis 15, this is the chapter that we uh, turn to where God says to Abraham, uh, don't be afraid, I'm your uh, shield and exceeding great reward. And Abraham wants to understand how God uh, is going to give him the promises of a seed and of the land. Uh, and the answer that comes back through that chapter is, look, Abraham, this is uh, a promise for after your death and resurrection. Uh, and before you receive the promise, your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not theirs, then shall serve them, and they shall afflict them 400 years, and afterward they shall come out with great substance. So when Joseph, at the end of his life, looked back uh, and understood, as he did, what God had done and why, he had confidence that this was the fulfillment of Genesis 15, and that, in fact, he was the first Israelite to go down uh, into Egypt and to be afflicted there. Uh, and that afterwards, uh, they would come out with great substance, as God had promised to Abraham those years before. So when he made mention of the departing of the children of Israel, uh, he was effectively recalling the promise of Genesis 15, uh, verse 13, 14, as we've got on the screen there. So that's just an indication for us that his mind was on the covenant promises, that he knew uh, the things that God had said to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. Now, I'd suggest to you, therefore, that if he knew this particular promise, he likely, or, or I would even go as far as to say certainly, knew them all. So where was his inspiration coming from then? How did he hold on through that terrible trial that he had to endure? We're not going to spend long on these. Uh, again, we just put them up here uh, for you as you're reflecting on Joseph and, and, and trying to live through that trial with him. What are the things that he might have drawn on to give him strength to continue through that trial. So, you know, God saying to Abraham right back there at the beginning of those pilgrim principles, I will show you the land. I will walk with you. The Bible tells us that God was there with Joseph. I think he knew it too. I think it was part of what allowed him to hold on that God was with him. God meant it unto good. God was there with me, meaning it unto good. No doubt he's been told in, in detail how God had appeared to Abraham. I'm your shield. Don't be afraid. Your seed will be a stranger in a land that is not there. And at some point it dawned upon Joseph that this was him and his family. And so, of course, he also believed, as we've already pointed out, that afterwards they would come out with a great substance. Joseph was drawing inspiration from the covenant promises, from the things that God had said to Abraham. He knew about the promise of the land. He knew about the promise of Genesis 17, where God had said, I will be Elohim to you. I will be your strength. And Joseph absolutely had God as his strength. Uh, he would have heard the story how uh, when Abraham, who was also caused to wait, uh, you know, and Joseph had to wait in very different and in some ways harder circumstances, but both men had to wait. Uh, and when the promise didn't appear to be uh, being fulfilled, that those words, is anything too hard for Yahweh? However desperate this situation, God is still here. Nothing's too hard for him. We have to try and work through it together with him. Uh, these are words of the angels. So they may not have been uh, taught directly to Joseph. Um, as God was uh, preparing to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, the angels speak and they say, I know him, uh, Abraham. He will keep, he, he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of Yahweh. And as I say, we don't know that uh, and we're not suggesting that those words uh, of the angels there were were taught to uh, Joseph. Uh, he, he may well not have known them. Abraham may well uh, not have known them. Uh, but undoubtedly, uh, the culture of Abraham's house uh, was known by Joseph. The culture in Abraham's house was you keep the way of Yahweh. You do justice and judgment. Um, and God will bring upon Abraham the things that he has spoken uh, of. This was Joseph's faith. He had lived uh, in that culture. And as I say, not all of his brothers uh, adhered to it quite clearly, but uh, doubtless Jacob and Leah and Rachel, uh, and as we saw, uh, maybe Isaac as well, uh, they had taught this young man well. He had witnessed that culture of keeping the way of Yahweh. 
his own father, you know, I'm sure Jacob relayed in detail again the stories of what had happened to him, how God had said to him, as we saw again in our previous talk, I will not leave you until I've done what I spoke to you of. Uh, what had he spoken to him of? The land, the kingdom, the seed. Um, remember that Joseph was six years old. That's what we established when uh, Jacob was coming out of Laban's house. No doubt it was a momentous moment. I'm sure he remembered it. What did uh, Jacob say to Laban on that day? God has seen my affliction. Joseph was afflicted in Egypt. Uh, he'd heard as a young boy, his father saying, God has seen me through this trial. Uh, and here's his inspiration uh, that God saw his affliction too. Jacob understood the God of Israel. He saw himself as unworthy of all the mercy and all the truth that God had showed him. He knew the name of God. He knew the character of God. His name was changed to Israel, uh, illustrating that his strength was in God. He had been promised as Abraham had the land, and that promise was to Jacob's seed as well. These are the things this young man held as dear and precious. These are the things that got him through his trial, brothers and sisters. And so finally, uh, alongside making mention of the departing of the children of Israel, having that clarity that God would follow through on his promises, he also gave commandment concerning his bones. And, you know, I used to read through Hebrews 11 and think to myself, well, why does God choose this as an example of Joseph's faith? It seemed to me, at least at one point, to be so many better things, more faithful things that, uh, that Joseph had done in his life that God could have chosen to record. And yet it was this thing that he chose. He gave commandment concerning his bones. The making mention of the parting of the children of Israel, as we see, was his faith and assurance in, in the covenant promises, the thing that God had said to Abraham he would do. And of course, there were other things that God had said to Abraham he would do as well, including resurrection. And we can't go through it now. We don't have time. But in that same Genesis 15 chapter, as we indicated, when Abraham says to God, you know, how do I know? How do I know that I'm going to inherit it? How is this going to work? And God comes back with this answer. Uh, it's going to happen, Abraham, that you will die. And that afterwards, your, your, your seed will become servants in a strange land. They'll be afflicted 400 years. And it's only after all of this, and after you have uh, died in a good old age and have slept with your fathers, that eventually your seed will inherit the land. So uh, Abraham had been taught by God resurrection. And I would suggest to you uh, that Joseph believed in that too. We, we know that Abraham did. In fact, Hebrews 11 called it out, didn't it? He thought about resurrection at the time he was asked to offer up his son Isaac, counting uh, that God was able to raise him up from the dead. That's what the writer to the Hebrews says. So Abraham was a man who had faith in resurrection. I suggest to you, therefore, so too was Isaac, so too was Jacob, so too was Joseph. And so when he gives commandment concerning his bones, his thought is on the kingdom, his thought is on resurrection. His thought is on a time when many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake. And he wanted his bones to be taken back to Israel. It's fascinating, isn't it, that of all those who slept in the dust of the earth there that we looked at in our first class in uh, that cave there uh, near Mamre, near Hebron. Uh, I, I guess, again, I would have thought, well, Joseph's bones surely would have ended up there as well. Uh, but we know from the end of Joshua that he was, in fact, buried in Shechem. And we might think to ourselves, well, why did he end up in a different place? And I think it tells us that uh, it's not about where your bones are buried. Uh, it's about what's coming next when those who are in the dust of the earth shall awake. Joseph had faith in the resurrection. He wanted his bones to be back in Israel because his hope, his heritage was the hope of Israel. 110 years he lived. 17 in Israel, 93 in Egypt, and Israel won through. At the age of 17, his confidence, his assurance, uh, his belief in the covenant promises which God had taught to Abraham, to Isaac, and to Jacob meant more to him than anything he could have had in Egypt. It brought him through a period of intense trial, and it stayed with him as he was made governor in Egypt he was able to look back and say, God did this unto good. He is recorded for his faith in believing those covenant promises that God would indeed bring his 
uh, people out of Egypt, he gave commandment concerning his bones because like his forefathers, he passionately believed in the kingdom and in resurrection. So as we've thought together, brothers and sisters, uh, very inadequately, I must say, uh, about a pilgrim in trial, please uh, try and spend some time with this remarkable young man as he goes through that trial, uh, even a period where he could not walk. Uh, he was everything that the scriptures ask of us in terms of being a pilgrim. He was able to look back, as we've seen, and say God meant all of this, all of this unto good. So as we invariably in our lives, brothers and sisters, go through trials and we hope and pray for uh, everyone gathered today uh, that our trials will not be akin to those of Joseph. Uh, let us also develop that faith to see the hand of our God in our lives as we go through the good times and the bad, that we too uh, can have the faith to look back and say, God meant this unto, unto good. He is good. He was there. His hand was in this. He's still with us. And more so, brothers and sisters, let us have the same faith that Joseph had, that God would indeed fulfill his covenant promises. He will indeed raise those that sleep in the dust of the earth and give them the glories of the kingdom. We look forward to a day when Joseph uh, will receive the due recompense of reward uh, that God will give him by grace when the Lord Jesus Christ comes. Thank you. Oh.